very good morning to you. Uh, I continue on this anatomical and physiological basis of bioelectromagnetism. I started last week on synapses, receptor cells, and brain, and I will uh, finish that chapter today. Well, I, I think I did discuss that yesterday. I go to the anatomy and physiology of the brain. I do not go too much to the details, but just some general observations on the anatomy and physiology of the brain. <laughs> I start with a X-ray image of brain. The main parts of the brain, well, I, I think you, you know quite a, lot, quite a lot of these issues, but I still want to quickly repeat this. The main parts of the human brain are the uh, lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and then cerebellum and spinal cord. I just in the minute tell more about their function. Uh, in and around the brain, there is a very important circulation of cerebrospinal fluid, which is uh, maintaining the brain in addition to the blood circulation. I don't go too much to the, to the details, but here, from the bioelectrical point of view, it is important to uh, observe and recognize that the fluid is between the skull and the brain tissue, and it has different electrical resistivity than the other tissues. Uh, there's a lot of information available of the localization and function and association pathways of the cortex. I do not, again, want to go too much to the details, but I just want to mention here that in the frontal lobe there is the biological intelligence of man, and there are the regions for motoric and sensory functions. It is possible to find regions uh, which are uh, concentrated on such functions as writing and speech, understanding, reading, and so on. I want to warn you that please do not think that the borders between different functions are very accurate. They are, they are rather flexible. This is just the same information here given from one hemisphere. The structure of the cerebral cortex uh, is different in different regions. Uh, there's a sensory cortex region, uh, associational cortex, and motor cortex. You find that the different layers in the uh, cerebral cortex have different thicknesses in different regions. Here I give an overview uh, of structures and functions of the major components of the brain, what's happening in various regions. Uh, in brain stem, there are the most, uh, 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 how could I say, simple, basic uh, uh, functions, uh, like origin of majority of peripheral cranial nerves. I come to the cranial nerves in a minute cardiovascular, respiratory, respiratory, and digestive control centers, regulation of muscle reflexes involved with equilibrium and posture. I hope you can possibly read on the screen. Reception and uh, integration of all synaptic input from spinal cord and role in sleep-wake cycle. So very basic functions are in, in the brain stem here in the lower regions. In cerebellum, there are maintenance of balance, enhancement of musical tone, coordination of planning of skilled voluntary muscle acti activity. So muscle movements are controlled here. Hypothalamus, regulation of many homeostatic functions, such as temperature control, thirst, urine output, and food intake. Important link between nervous and endocrine system, extensive involvement with emotion and basic behavioral patterns. In thalamus, in the center of the brain, relay station for all synaptic input, 
crude awareness of sensation, some decrease of consciousness, role in motor, motor control. Basal nuclei have inhibition of muscle tone, coordination of slow, sustained movements, suppression of useful, useless patterns of movement. And finally, on the cerebral cortex, on the surface layer of the brain, sensory perception, voluntary control of movements, language, personality traits, sophisticated mental events such as thinking, memory, decision making, creativity and self-consciousness. So the personality, personality mainly is on the cerebral cortex. This region, hypothalamus and thalamus, is called the encephalon, and I tell it therefore that I again introduce you one Nobelist, Walter Rudolf Hess, received a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of the functional organization of the interbrain as a coordinator of the activities of internal organs. So interbrain is the diencephalon, the part of the brain that includes the basal ganglia, thalamus, hypothalamus and associated areas. So again, one novelist in bioelectromagnetism. Here is a quite clear division for two regions in, in brain, division for sensory and motor functions. Sensory means that uh, 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 the, the we sense uh, different uh, uh, things in, in the body and in the body movement and, 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 and touch and so on. In, in the sensory cortex, which is in this region, and we control the movement of the body with this region of the brain, which is the motor cortex. That is quite uh, clearly divided these regions. Uh, here is the front of the brain and here is the back of the brain. I give some more information on this quite soon. Well, the pyramidal system, I do not go to, too much to the details, but shows how, the, how this uh, information is, uh, is proceeding in, in, in the nervous system. Perhaps we do not go too much to these details. This is a beautiful picture. This is so-called homunculus. It describes uh, which regions in the sensory cortex and in motor cortex are connected to certain uh, corresponding regions in the body. Uh, here is some uh, quite basic but, but interesting information, which is that uh, uh, it's during the, the present time of computers, it is easy to understand that uh, the body is not uh, evenly divided uh, to this uh, sensory cortex or motor cortex, but those regions of the body which have a more accurate sensation, of course, occupy more space in, in the brain and those regions which have not so accurate sensation like the central of the body don't need so much space from the uh, sensory cortex. So the size of the parts of the body here represent how large region of the sensory cortex is represented by those regions of the body. It is quite similar division uh, between uh, in, in sensory and in motor cortex, you may find here. Uh, observations which we can do here are, as I said, that uh, for instance, the hand in man is very accurate in movement. Think a pianist who is playing piano with the other fingers, or, or a person who is typing typing with a computer some some text. Very accurate movement uh, is needed. In, in the uh, hand, therefore, the region in the brain for the motoric region is quite much larger than from the central part of the body, even though the central part of the body is physically larger. Important here is to observe that it is, it is the mouth and, and the, the, the throat, the region where, where the speech is generated, which occupies 
very much, relatively very much, from the brain. The lips are very sensitive, and uh, all this region, uh, mouth and throat and upper part of the respiratory uh, tract, needs a lot of information capacity in sensing and in, in motoric functions because producing speech is very, very complicated issue, very complicated issue, and, and fine details, including very fine details. I just briefly mentioned the cranial nerves. There are a couple of nerves which proceed directly from the brain to certain regions of the body, uh, connecting information path and, and, and uh, sensing and, and uh, uh, movement in those regions. Olfactory is number one, which is just uh, smelling. Optic nerve for uh, vision. Movement of the eye is very accurate process. It is connected, of course, to the vision, but also to the balance. I, I tell you later on, it is very strong uh, effect uh, onto the balance sensing. Uh, then to the trigeminal nerve, to the face, masticatory nerve for, uh, for to the jaws, and so on. Acoustic nerve to the ear, auditory and vestibular, so this, uh, I mean listening and for balance, for uh, larynx, for vagus nerve, for the center of the body, and, and then accessory and hypoglossal cranial nerves. Some words about functional neuroanatomy, about acoustic systems, system, I just magnify this, uh, the region where it is sensed, uh, the, the, the sounds in the brain is in this region, in, in the cochlea, in the ear, uh, there's regions for higher and then for lower sounds, and what is the mechanism in the in the, in the cochlea? There there is uh, of course liquid, and when the liquid is vibrating, there are very sensitive hair cells which sense the vibration, which is the sound on different pitches on different uh, levels. Vestibular control means uh, the, the balance sensing. It is, everything is smart here, but just from, from the basic engineering point of view, it is nice to see how beautifully this vestibular control system is designed. If someone would ask some uh, competent mechanical engineers to design a good vestibular s controlling system, I think he would do it just like this. Uh, it has uh, three canals. In, in the ear, uh, this balance organ. Three canals which are in the three orthogonal uh, orientations so that they are able to detect the balance in all these uh, three uh, orientations and of course all their combinations. And in addition to that, it detec detects uh, uh, the acceleration the movement, and also the static orientation. Both of those, it's fantastic. The acceleration is, well, in these canals, there is, of course, liquid. Acceleration or movement is detected by these sensors, uh, which are in the liquid. And when there is acceleration in the head, the liquid leaves behind because of the acceleration and bends these sensors and it is detected as acceleration. The static orientation is detected with stones which exist in the canals down right down corner here. I have a magnification on this. Small stones which fall to the lowest part of the canal and irritate these sensing hairs. So this is the, these are the uh, stones which indicate the uh, static orientation and this is the sensor which senses the acceleration. 
these calcium crystal stones are in this microphotograph, they are about 0 0.01 millimeter long. And here are the vestibular canals, which are in three orthogonal orientation. Just basic engineering design. Very fantastic that such a system we have in the here. And we have two of those systems, both of them uh, uh, operate in the same way. So it is kind of uh, uh, an insurance system to ensure that if one uh, balancing system is destroyed, the other one still exists. In uh, normal life, we get the most important information of balance with vision. Some of you may have visited in amusement park some movie theater which have the whole wall is a movie screen and it has some special film effects and the film is going so on. People are standing in the theater and suddenly they all are falling down because they, they are looking at the, the movie which is made in such way that it gives an illusion of, of, of uh, unusual uh, uh, balancing. So it is the visual, visual uh, uh, information which is the number one in our balancing. Then in normal life, the number two is coming from how we feel and sense our body uh, from, the, from the muscles and, and, and bones. That's, that's the number two. And number three is coming from the vestibular organ. In special situation, for instance, if, uh, if uh, we are uh, s swimming in the dark water, diving in the dark water, on, on the cloudy day when we, we don't have any orientation from the, from the body, not from the vision, then the main source for uh, balance is coming from the ear. It's a very complicated system. Here, is, here are shown the G three canals. You find that they are really orthogonal to each other and they are also a microphotograph. The control of the eye movements, I come later on to the e electrooculography, that is a very, very sophisticated system, just for those reasons, first for being able to, to see the uh, visual effect, secondly for helping in balance control. Here is the latest information about the different divisions of the brain, in what kind of, what kind of uh, functions they do include. We could perhaps spend longer time on here, but maybe I, I just go on. Let's go to the heart. As I told you on the first lecture, the heart is an electromechanical motor. It is electronically controlled. It has two chambers with turbo. It is maintenance free and during the lifetime, about 75 years, in average, it makes 3 billion cycles. It is a fun, fantastic engine. I ask you, when was made the first anatomical document in cardiology? Do you know? Any idea? Which? I, I don't quite... Uh, Maybe Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. No, that's not correct. He was a talented guy and he made work on this here also, on the anatomy of the heart. But the first one was about 25,000 years ago in El Pindal Cave, Riba de Deva, Os Asturias in Spain. In, in the cave painting, the ancient man did paint a, a mammoth on the wall here is to, to see it more clearly, I show it like this. And the only anatomical structure in this uh, painting of mammoth was the heart. And perhaps therefore that they just uh, recognize that that is the part where the, uh, where the spears has to be uh, oriented when, when killing a mammoth, maybe. 25,000 years ago, quite a long time ago. This cave is in uh, Spain in Riba de Deva, 
that is the opening of the cave and that is a long, long cave. Uh, and at the end of the cave, here is the painting of the mammoth. Heart is important organ. Here's a, these are very beautiful pictures of this uh, Leonard Nilsson. I have shown them and show you some more. In the very, very young, small human embryo, the only and the first anatomical structure you, which you may find is the heart. Here is Mr. Leonard Nilsson, a Swedish medical photographer who uh, published a book, Behold Man, which means look man, and, and excellent anatomical photographs. Uh, in ancient times it has been believed that, uh, that the soul of man is in the heart. Uh, it has been thought that the brain don't have anything else to do than cool the blood, but the soul of the man is in the heart, and it is quite easy to understand this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, issue, therefore, that uh, when, when a person is uh, exhausted, the heart starts to, to, to uh, beat faster. And therefore, uh, for instance, when someone is a very friendly person, it is said that he is a warm-hearted person. And f here is an example, the famous pianist, Polish pianist, Fred and, and composer Frédéric Chopin uh, died in Paris and his body is bur buried to Paris. Here is his grave, but his heart was removed in the, from the body and buried to the Church of Holy Cross in Warsaw. That's how people feel the function of the heart, that it is more sensational, uh, emotional and, and, and personal organ. In fact, in anatomy, we all know, of course, today that it is the brain where is the emotion really exists and the heart has the blood pumping function. Here is Mr. Netter. Here is Mr. Netter, who is the artist. From the present books of physiology, you find large, large number of different kind of, of anatomical drawings of the body. Uh, just for historical reasons, I show these illustrations of Frank Netter, uh, which are very clear illustrations. I show you the anatomy of the heart with a series of, of uh, Netter illustrations. Here is opened the chest of the body. You find that, that the rib cage is opened here you find that the lungs are in kind of sacs, which are, which are called uh, pleura. And between the lungs behind there is one kind of sac, which is called pericardium. Uh, and inside there is the heart. So you do not see the heart yet. It is further opened, the chest, and the lungs are now taken to the sides. You see the big arteries and veins here, the diaphragm muscle above which the heart is lying. And still you do not really see the heart because it is inside the sac. I call it sac. Uh, it's a pericardium. You find that the heart, uh, it is uh, commonly thought that the heart is on the left side. Actually, it is very much on the center, a little bit, two, uh, in average, about two centimeters to the left. So not too much to the left. Now you see the heart. The heart is seen here. You see the right atrium looking. You can see it here. Right ventricle here. Left ventricle is quite much behind. And left atrium is so far behind that you do not see it. So it's, uh, the heart is rotated 45 degrees so that in front of the heart is the right ventricle. So they are not right and left here, but the right ventricle is in front of the heart. In this cross section, you find it more clearly. Uh, back there is a spine, spinal cord in front. 
is the uh, sternum on right and left it is surrounded by lungs here's the descending aorta and esophagus right atrium it is really on the right the right ventricle you see now clearly that it is just in front left ventricle is on the left and left atrium is behind so it is rotated 45 degrees in, in both directions, about 45 degrees. From bioelectrical point of view, it is important to note here that the bones have quite high electric resistivity and the lungs have also high electric resistivity so that the heart is surrounded with, by high resistivity tissue. Here is a cross section of the heart. You find from here uh, uh, the valves, uh, tricuspidal valve, the mitral valve, and the uh, aortic valve and uh, pulmonal valve is there also see. I return to this illustration and emphasize one fact that the wall of the right ventricle is very or relatively thin but the wall of the left ventricle is very thick. And why is that? Why they do not have a similar thickness? Any idea on this? Everything in the body, or almost everything, is really in purpose made like that. You have the suggestion. Mm -hmm. rest of the body that's right <laughs> that's right the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs and the resistance in the lungs it is a smaller region it is smaller and the left ventricle pumps the blood to the rest of the body and it needs stronger stronger uh, work so that is really in purpose that the left ventricle has thicker wall and again, this has important effect to the electrocardiogram, seen also here. I show you something about the, more about the anatomy of the body. I show you some material of the quite interesting uh, project, which is uh, made in the U.S. National Library of Medicine and National Institute of Health. It is... Uh, uh, the visible human man. And what is that? I show you here just a, 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 a movie. I hope it works. Here is a really, a real human cadaver, a body of the dead person, which is frozen in water. And it is uh, with this system, which I will show, it is cut very thin slices from this uh, body and take a photograph, slice and a photograph. And this photographic material gives a very accurate, real anatomic information. Let's see if I'm able to show this movie. Yeah, it, apparently I, made, I may be able. It looks promising. So it is... Uh, taken a very thin slice off and here is the body and the other hand and the person is then cleaning this preparate so I'm giving some moisture on that comes visually more better and then taking a photograph on that so photograph is taken 
So in this way, it is gone through the whole body, taking photographs from very thin uh, or slices with a small difference, difference uh, from the previous one. And this information, photographic information, is the anatomic three-dimensional information of the whole body. And uh, I show the photographs. Here is first shown the whole body of the uh, cadaver. I hope I get this working. It looks promising. It's going through the whole body. That is like a man anatomically looks. I go to the next one, which is, uh, I may show here, okay. I think, yes, I have uh, some special, uh, a, f a few photographs here in more accurately that's the head the body you see the lungs and the heart lower part of the, of the stomach the pelvis the legs and the feet here i show you just this region of the thorax only i hope i get it working because that is interesting when we're speaking about the heart Can I get it magnified? Yes, I get it. The lungs, uh, the heart is just coming to see here. It's going from top to d down. The atria, the ventricle, left ventricle wall, you find how thick it is. Right ventricle. And then the liver is seen. I'll show you again. The top of the lungs, the atria are coming to see. Then come the ventricles. The left ventricle is seen clearly here how thick it is on the walls, right ventricle. And the lungs. So this information this is a uh, visible, visible human project. I should have had the name in the first slide. So the first one was visible human man. And the next project was visible human woman. And that was more accurate. And this data, I do not have the year here when it started the project, but it is very important and valuable data. There are several conferences, international conferences, held based on this data where research groups have made different kind of applications from this accurate anatomical data. And I show you one application. But again, nothing new under the sun, as I used to say. Here is topographic anatomischer atlas nach Durschnitten an gefrorenen Kadaven, made in Leipzig, 872 so long time ago. Wilhelm Brauner and C. Schmiedel made, and here's one example, exactly similar, similar information made uh, 150 years ago. Unbelievable. I come to the heart muscle. Uh, heart muscle is a striated muscle. I said you in the beginning that there do exist in the body striated muscles and smooth muscles. There are two kinds of striated muscles. They are the skeletal muscles and the heart, and the smooth muscles are in the internal organs and, for instance, raising the, the hairs of the skin and, and uh, so on. The skeletal muscles are voluntary. We are able to control the movement of the skeletal muscles. The heart muscle, even though it is striated also, it is not possible to control voluntarily, as you well know. And the name striated, the stripes come from the fact that in the 
microscopical structure of the muscle, it is seen different kind of color uh, stripes due to the fact that there do exist a thin and thick filaments and in that is a cross section and when the muscle is contracting these uh, filaments uh, are gliding between each other and making the shorter the muscle and this striation looks a bit different very basic basic anatomy from bioelectric point of view and of course from physiological point of view there is one special property in the structure and function of the heart muscle. Firstly, here is given the name for the cardiac muscle. It is called syncesium. That is a difficult word. What means syncesium? Well, uh, it's a name for that kind of, of muscle. What is in the muscle special from the bioelectric point of view as well is that when some region of the muscle is activated, the electric activity from that point spreads to the adjacent cells and finally throughout the muscle. Activating one point means that the activation spreads throughout the muscle, with one exception, which is that the atria form one part and there is a borderline isolation and the ventricles form another part. So normally the activation wave is not able to proceed over this borderline except there is a special conduction, conduction system along which it is proceeding. Here are shown the fibers of the uh, ventricular muscle. They are oriented tangentially. This is again important from the bioelectric point of view. Therefore, that the uh, progress or proceeding of the activation is very much faster in the direction of the fibers than normal to the fibers. I show you some data. Here is also seen that, as I pointed out, the left ventricle is thicker than the right ventricle. It is not only that the cells were thicker, no, there are more cells, there's extra fibers here on the, uh, around the left ventricle. And again, a beautiful picture of the papillary muscle from the apex, from the, the, from the, the, from the bottom of the ventricle, is this kind of muscles going to the speed and mitral valves. Some words about the anatomy and physiology of the heart. You mentioned a gentleman there on the third row. Hello? You mentioned, no, please read if you want, but I just want to <laughs> observe that you mentioned that, that, that it was uh, Leonardo da Vinci who made the first model. Sorry to interrupt your <laughs> activities. Okay. And, and this, is, this is his model. So you were almost correct. <laughs> That's I wanted to point. So he, Leonardo da Vinci made a kind of model for the heart. I do not go too much to the details. He was a very genius gentleman. Uh, even though he was ge genius and he was able to find that there are left and right sides of the ventricle, he was not able to understand the blood circulation. And the reason is that the blood circulation goes through the capillary uh, arteries and veins, which are so thin that without a good microscopic uh, instrumentation, they cannot be seen. And it was William Harvey who completely described the blood circulation in 1616. Well, the cardiac cycle, this is basic information which you know, but I still show the slides which I have here. Uh, starting from the atrial contraction, left and right atria to serve as turbo filling the ventricles and then the ventricles uh, uh, contract and feed the blood to the right side and to the left side. And the same is shown here, not too much about that. I did show you this already quite in the beginning, but I still 
return to this generation of the bioelectric signal because this is shown in the cardiac muscle. And uh, the reason I show you here is that the, after the depolarization, there is so-called plateau phase. This is a real-time scale for a cardiac muscle uh, of the frog. There is a quite long time when uh, uh, it is the cardiac muscle cell is depolarized. And then takes place the repo repolarization. Sorry, it is depolarized. Uh, re re depolarized. And repolarization and uh, because the potassium ions are flowing out, the potential inside the cell returns to the resting state. And uh, the sodium potassium ion pump restoring the ionic palace. I told you this before. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Now I come to these uh, electrical and mechanical functions. Uh, here is a frog sartorius muscle, which is a striated muscle and which is voluntary muscle. In this kind of voluntary muscles, the electric activation is very similar to the electric activation of nerve cells. The time is about in the order of one millisecond, the depolarization, and then it returns back. The muscle contraction, because it is mechanical contraction, mechanical process is much slower and contracts like this and takes long time to relax compared to the activation depolarization time. Here is a uh, cardiac muscle, frog cardiac muscle. Here you see that the time scale is now two seconds here. So it is about one second is the depolarization time. And after depolarization, the muscle contracts and after repolarization, it relaxes. In human heart, this time is shorter less than one second. And then here is a, a, a smooth muscle, which is non-voluntary. You find the electric activation is very slow. Here is 40, 40 seconds, 50 seconds is the time scale. And the muscle's contraction is very slow. So that is a difference in the timing of, of uh, uh, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. The activation process in the heart starts from sinoatrial node. That is a specialized atrial cells, cardiac muscle cells, which initiate the activation. Activation proceeds along a certain conduction paths along the atrium. And I would rather say that especially just along the atrial walls. So I, I don't quite know about these, uh, these atrial conduction paths, which are indicated here. Perhaps they do exist. It proceeds to the atrioventricular node, which is between the atria and ventricles. I'll show you timing in the minute. But anyhow, it proceeds very slowly in the AV node. It continues along the common bundle, which is called bundle of He's, because it was Wilhelm He's who uh, found it first. Continues on the right ventricle to the right bundle branch. It is divided into two branches. Right bundle branch, which continues to Purkinje fibers. And then on the left side, there's a left bundle which is divided to Purkinje fibers. So Wilhelm Hees was uh, a Swiss-German uh, anatomist born in Basel, but he was a professor in Berlin who gave the name to the, the bundle of Hees. And Jan Evangelista Purkinje was a Czech anatomist who gave the name to the Purkinje fibers. Here is again so the, something Sm very smart thing. So I'm so fascinated about the, the smart issues in the body, which are made just in the way as a, as a talented electrical engineer would like to design them. Uh, there's intrinsic frequency of the conduction system. Intrinsic frequency means that if you separate a piece of the tissue, put it on the bowl, 
and look it it starts to contract uh, with a certain intrinsic frequency so it is it is it's natural frequency to contract the sinus node has its intrinsic frequency of about 70 per minute so about once per second the AV node has intrinsic frequency of about 50 per minute and finally the Purkinje fibers about 15 to 30 per minute this is smart again very smart therefore that of course because the activation proceeds along the cardiac muscle continuously the region which has the control is that which has the fastest fastest intrinsic frequency and that is the sinus node so in normal case the whole heart is beating with the frequency which is given by the sinus node if the sinus node fails and is not any more active then the AV node which has the second fastest intrinsic frequency takes the command and the heart starts to beat with the AV node frequency that is still so high frequency that the person may live quite almost quite normally or uh, don't have any any danger if it happens that the AV node breaks or this con uh, tract uh, uh, this uh, uh, bundle of heat breaks here so that activation is not able to come from the atria to the ventricles the ventricles have their own intrinsic frequency which is about 50 to 30 per minute beating pumping so much brain that the person does not die the brain gets sufficient amount of blood to stay alive but not enough to keep the person consciousness conscious the person falls down uh, and loses the consciousness but don't die so that is a very important system to ensure life very smart system here I show you some uh, numbers. I don't go through all this stuff here, but you find that the conduction velocity in atrial muscle, right and left, is about roughly one meter per second. In AV node, I said that it is very slowly proceeding in that region. The activation proceeds about two to five centimeters per second. Very slowly which causes an important delay there. I come to this again. Then in bundle of his, about the same as in atria, 1 to 1 1.5 meters per second, but in Purkinje fibers, 3 to 3.5 meters per second. This all is very important, very important. And I come to this again. The, uh, I go into details of the electrophysiology of the heart. Activation begins in the sinus node, as I told many times. If you place a microelectrode to the sinus node, you may record that kind of signal. And here is given the full electrocardium here below. It represents that region here. Atrial muscles show that kind of activation and it is a p wave which is uh, uh, generated by the atrial activity then in av node you can record this kind of signal bundle of his you can record this kind of signal but because its surface area cross-sectional area is so small it is not possible to find any signal on the surface of the chest due to the activation of common bundle so it is on this region bundle branches give this kind of activation again small cross-sectional area don't see in ECG Purkinje fibers give this activation and then the ventricular muscle gives this activation 
inner side of ventricular muscle and outer side of ventricular muscle. Here you may find several important issues designed by the very competent electrical engineer. You find that the sinus node has the highest intrinsic frequency and it has the command. Everything follows sinus node. Activation proceeds as a wave along the atrial muscles and make the atrial muscles to contract. There's electric isolation between atria and ventricles, so the activation do not, does not proceed directly from atria to ventricles. There's isolation. It proceeds only along the conduction path. Here is a time delay between atria and ventricles due to the very slow progress of activation in the AV node. And the time delay you can see here. That is the time delay. And that is very important time delay. Why it is so important? The reason is that the atria function is to be a turbo. They do fill the ventricles. The ventricles are smooth, soft, uh, not smooth muscle because they're striated muscle, but they are soft muscle and there is a high pressure in the, in the body. So they would not fill so effectively unless the atria help them to fill and serving as a turbo. But it takes a certain time, of course, for the blood to flow from the atria to the ventricles. And it is important that the ventricles wait for the time to be able to completely fill up. And after that, they contract and pump the blood. If they would contract earlier, the ventricles would not fill up. And this important delay is here due to the very slow progress of activation in the AV node. Isn't that smart? Just excellent control. Then there is fast progress of activation in Purkinje fibers. And why is that important? If the ventricles would uh, contract uh, uh, slowly, partially, then the net volume of the ventricles would not change so much. But if practically all parts of the ventricles contract at the same time, then the pumping is, of course, most effective. Very smart again. And this is due to the fast progress of activation in the Purkinje fibers. It's smart. The intrinsic frequency in ventricles is low, which means that they do not have uh, own activity uh, control because everything comes from the sinus node, except the activation don't proceed for some reason uh, from the uh, atria to the ventricles. Here is something which I do not know why it is. It is just by chance. I don't see any functional reason for this. Which is that if you observe that the endocardial muscle, the inner side muscles, the muscle cells of ventricles, activate like this, outer side epicardial muscles activate like this, Epicardial activation, of course, starts later than endocardial because activation is proceeding along the wall. But it is shorter that the activation discontinues or ends earlier than in the endocardial side. Why is that? Well, there do, anatomically, there do exist three different kind of cells in the ventricles. Endocardial side, one type. Epicardial side, one type. And in the middle, a third type. And they have different activation time. That is the reason why, why it looks like that. And as a consequence, 
the depolarization is proceeding from inside to out, but the repol repolarization is proceeding from outside to in. And that has a fundamental effect to the electrocardiogram. That has, therefore, the electrocardiogram looks as it looks like. But why is this? Is there any ana anatomical or is there any physiological reason? Has the engineer who has designed this just made a joke or is there some, some reason why to do this? I, I do not know any, any real physiological reason why it should be like this. I don't know. But that's how it is and it is good to know that it is like that. Here is a seminal work of Dutch colleagues Durer, Van Damme, Freud, Janse, Meiler and Arsbacher, published in 1970, Total Excitation of the Isolated Human Heart. Isolated. This was quite dramatic. In 1970, at those times there were not made any heart transplantations, like today. Today it is just normal, normal surgical operation to make a heart transplantation and there is no uh, it, it's standard, standard operations, but at those times such were not made. So it was isolated, taken away from the body, the heart of the person, a patient, who had been in car accident and was brain dead. So quite dramatic at that time. Here are the, the, the Twell and Dirk Durer. They isolated the heart maintained it with, with blood and, and, and nutrition. They inserted to the cardiac muscle large, quite many, this kind of multipolar electrodes. You see that on the electrode, uh, this, this uh, construction, there are small electrodes throughout, so th which record electric potentials at those locations. And from each of those electrodes, wires are going proceeding out. These electrodes were placed, inserted to the cardiac muscle. And here is an illustration how they do locate. At those times, there were no computers to use. Fantastic work how they made it. They just had the uh, ECG uh, recorder, uh, the Elma Schoenander ECG recorder, inkjet recorder, which was uh, drawing the uh, signals to the paper, and the paper was going whoosh, very fast, and they were manually measuring the timing of the signals. Think about that. Today, no one does like that. Everyone has computers. And what was, here are the signals, and they made the measurements and timing of the signals. And what was the result of this work? Here is illustrated the ventricular muscle. It is cut and opened. Left ventricle, uh, uh, here is uh, left ventricle, you see the wall is thicker, and right ventricle there. And now we see how the electric activation proceeds in this cardiac muscle. That is the region where the activation starts. Generally, in the illustrations, also in those which I did show you, it is illustrated that in the ventricles there are two, there are bundle branches, right and left, and that's it. But actually, the left bundle has a very important anterior part, anteriorly proceeding bundle. So the anterior part of the left uh, bundle gives first activation to here, to the anterior part of the left ventricular muscle in five milliseconds. Then you see that it proceeds like a wave from those regions further on, 15 millimeter, uh, 50 milliseconds, 20, 25, and now starts the right ventricle activate. So left ventricle is already in halfway before the right ventricle starts and proceeds like that. Here happens something interesting from the bioelectric point of view. 
which is so-called breakthrough. The activation has proceeded on the right ventricle through the muscle because the right ventricular muscle is thinner than the left ventricular muscle. It proceeds faster to the outer surface and there is no activation at re that region anymore. And the left ventricular uh, breakthrough is coming later and proceeds in this way. And you may observe here also another feature which is in interesting and important from the bioelectric point of view, which is that in the beginning, in the first part of the activation, the activation is proceeding radially from the center to outwards. And in the later part, it is proceeding on the, especially on the right ventricle, tangentially. So first radially and then tangentially. That gives an important effect to the ECG, to the electric activity of the heart. I show you this again. Okay, sorry. I show you this again. I like this. So five milliseconds and starting from there, proceeding in this way. And this is from isolated human heart, but in the intact heart when it is in the body, it is quite the same. I try to show you, I hope it works. These are always exciting whether they do work or not. Electric potential on the surface of the heart. This is an interesting work of uh, Frank Sachse his PhD thesis, who was educated in Karlsruhe in Professor Dessel's laboratory, and then he moved to Salt Lake City and made his work there. He had the anatomical data, which I did show you, just the anatomical human visible man data. He digitized that and made a computer model, anatomical model of the body. Here is a visualization on, on the illustration from the anatomical numerical data which he has in the computer. In addition to model the anatomy of the heart, he modeled the electric activation of the heart and did show how it pr uh, proceeds in the heart muscle, how it uh, is associated with the ECG and how it gives is seen on the epicardial surface. Now let's see if, if I succeed. I hope I can show it to you. Yeah. So I, I explain it in, in detail in the second round. So it is shown on the left hand side I have shown the uh, corresponding electrocardiograms and here and you see the atrial activity and ventricular depolarization and repolarization and what is seen there it is not a photograph of a, a real anatomical uh, 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 real heart it is a numerical model which is displayed on the computer screen on the anatomy of the heart. Very nice work, anatomy and physiology of the heart. Here is another illustration. I did show you first this uh, Augustus Woller's picture of the, uh, of the, of the uh, potential distribution of the on surface of the chest due to the dipolar activation of the heart. And here is an electric model. I the movie don't work for some reason, but I have the. Uh, I hope that I can show it with the Zoom browser. It is the number two here. Yeah. So this is similarly made. This is just a computer model of the anatomy of the chest and the electric activation 
on the chest. On the top you have you see the corresponding electrocardiogram. Time is proceeding on the right. The electric activation is seen already in the chest. And then we come to the ventricular activation. It is seen here. Red is of course positive and blue is negative. And that is how the electric activation, electric field on the surface of chest really is behaving. And here is the T wave, the repolarization of the cardiac muscle. So that is what is happening once a second on the surface of your thorax, this electric field. About the genesis of the electrocardiogram, how the electrocardiogram is generated. Here is a cardiac piece of cardiac muscle. There are cardiac uh, uh, muscle cells, and here is an interstitial uh, uh, fluid in between the cells. In resting state, inside the cells, the potential is negative, and compared to that, the potential is positive in the interstitial space. Depolarization is proceeding from the right to left. Here you see that here is depolarized cells which are positive on inside and compared to that is negative in the middle. So this region forms a double layer because what we actually measure with this uh, voltmeter is not the potential inside the cells. No, we measure the potential in the interstitial space. And the bilayer is proceeding from the right hand to the left and it is generating positive signal because it is a positive here. In the repolarization situation is opposite when the cells are repolarizing, the inside is changing from positive to negative and relatively the interstitial space is changing from negative to positive and that's what we are measuring. This is this bilayer and we get negative signal to this detector. So this is uh, uh, a bit strange to think that we do not in surface electrocardiogram, when we don't make a micro electrode electro ECG to the inside the cells, but when we record the surface electrocardiogram, we do not record actually the potentials from the inside of the cells, that effect. We record the potential changes in the interstitial space. That is a paradox. The depolarization front is about one millimeter thick because the repolarization process is so fast. It's only one millimeter thick, but the depolarization, but the repolarization, because it is proceeding so slowly, it's about 100 millimeter thick. I have usually in this connection shown you the appendix A, that was about heart, Appendix A of the book, which is consistent system of rectangular and spherical coordinates for electrocardiology and magnetocardiology. Why do I show you this kind of coordinate system? There is a good reason for this because there is a lot of uh, confusing issues in the coordinate systems. If I ask you to draw X and Y coordinates on the paper, that's how you draw them. X in that direction and Y to that direction. If we record the ECG, the ECG cardiac vector is pointing left and down. The X signal looks like here. It is mainly positive. But because it is pointing downwards and the positive direction of Y signal is up, 
the Y ECG has negative deflections. What's the problem with that? The problem is that Mr. Eindhoven did not like to see negative deflections. He wanted to see positive deflections. And therefore, he decided to orient the Y coordinate downwards. Now both X and Y ECGs are positive. That is, that is a fact, believe or not. Then Mr. Frank, who made the best clinical vector cardiographic system, which is a three-dimensional ECG, needed the Z-coordinate. And he understood that the coordinate system must be right-handed. So if X is pointing to the left, Y is pointing down, then Z has to point back. He selected these coordinates and the American Heart Association in 1967 made recommendations that these are the coordinates. When you go to the hospital and meet cardiologists and ask them to show you the coordinate system and ask them to show you the X, Y and Z ECG signals, they give them to you in this coordinate system. But there is no ma physis physicist and mathematician who would like this coordinate system, because this is, this is very strange. The accepted coordinate planes are, they are fine. They are frontal, left sagittal and transverse. But how do they fit to these three coordinates? They don't fit well. Especially, as mathematicians, you know that these are the standard spherical coordinates. So if you fit spherical coordinates to these Cartesian coordinates, the human body lies like this. You need to cut the skin of the thorax along this path and spread it to get it uh, the, to show the spherical coordinates on the plane. I have seen sometimes publications on vector cardiography in the clinical journals showing the orientation of vectors in, in the, uh, in, in the, on the plane. And in those cases, the body is oriented like this in, in, the, in the paper. Very, very strange. Uh, there do exist different possibilities to orient the coordinates, but there exists only one which is logical. The body, the rectangular coordinate system, the alignment of the body axis, we should have alignment with the body axis. The accepted coordinate planes, the frontal, left sagittal and transversal, should be viewed from positive sides. And the coordinate system should be consistent with the mathematical coordinate system. And therefore, there exists only one consistent rectangular coordinate system for electrocardiology, which is this one. That is what the physicist draws if you want to ask him to or her to show the three dimensional coordinate system, X, Y and Z in those directions. Sagittal, frontal and transverse planes are seen from the positive sides. These are the planes. And the polar coordinate system connected to this looks like this, with one exception. Mathematically, cosine theta is the co-latitude, but let's take 90 minus that, which is the elevation, which is the opposite angle. Then the coordinate system looks like this, and you may imagine that the body skin of the patient is cut along the spine and spread in front here. And the coordinate projection is just the same as a geophysical or geological coordinate system of the world.
This is the transfer matrix uh, for uh, or, or, or the correspondence with the consistent system and the uh, American Heart Association coordinate system. So now there do exist two coordinate systems, consistent system and American Heart Association coordinate system. How to come with this? If you look the publications in IEEE Transaction of Biomedical Engineering and publications in Circulation and so on, you find that in the engineering publication, theoretical publications, you find that they are nowadays always given in the consistent coordinate system. If you take the clinical cardiological publications, you find that unfortunately they are shown in the American Heart Association coordinate system. We have tried to change the world in the clinical side, but we're not too successful. When we published some clinical publications and use the consistent coordinate uh, system for displaying the results, the reviewer said that, yes, this is a fine paper, but would you please like to use the correct coordinate system, the American Heart Association. And we changed the coordinates and that's it. But anyhow, if you do theoretical work, please use the consistent system as your colleagues are doing with that. This is a surprising, surprising issue that the American Heart Association uses the wrong coordinate, wrong, I say wrong coordinate system. But that is how the history develops. But it's good to know what, what's the history of the American Heart Association, or the clinical system, and what is the real consistent system. Well, I may have the time later on in, in uh, the magnetocardiology to tell about the ABC coordinate system, which is just specially for one application of magnetocardiography. I do not spend time at the moment. So that was the coordinate system. And I still have 15 minutes time, about which I'm very happy. And I hope that you enjoy that also. I go to the part two of the book. Bioelectric sources and conductors and their modeling. I start to speak about volume source and volume conductor. What is a volume source? And what is a volume conductor? And why do I speak about those? If you think just uh, basic electronic circuits which uh, you have studied in applied electronics, uh, putting some electronic components on the board and, and connecting them. Theoretically, these resistors, batteries, capacitors and inductors, they, in these circuits, they are ideal components concentrated on the certain point and connected with certain wires. That's how they look in electronics. In bioelectromagnetism, the situation is fundamentally different. The source is not this kind of battery. In reality, it is a three-dimensional, having a certain volume, like the heart. It is rather large. And the conductor is not a couple of wires, but it is a three-dimensional large volume. And therefore, we need new methods, theoretical methods, to be able to analyze these three-dimensional sources and three-dimensional conductors. And that is the fundamental issue in bioelectromagnetism. I start this theory speaking about volume source in a homogeneous volume conductor. In this material, in this course, in the book and on these lectures, every then and now you find this kind of box, which is, uh, has a title, Preconditions. And it tells 
in what kind of source and in what kind of conductor the following theory holds. Because the sources may be, uh, may be and conductors may be uh, simplified or more detailed or different kind of, so the theory is a bit different uh, in various situations. So please observe what are the preconditions to the following theory and they hold so long until the next preconditions do appear. So in this theory, just as the title said, we're speaking about discussing the situation in a volume source, uh, 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 discussing a volume source which is in a conductor which is infinite and homogeneous. See, what is an infinite homogeneous conductor? It is a conductor whose electrical properties don't change and which extends to infinity. Does such conductor exist? No, it doesn't practically exist, mathematically yes, but practically not. But I have often given the example that if in electrocardiography you want to model an infinite homogeneous volume conductor, it can be done so that you place the patient to the Atlantic Ocean between uh, uh, Scotland and uh, uh, New York to the depth of 2.5 kilometers, then the Atlantic Ocean is quite close to the infinite homogeneous volume conductor. It is also assumed, if not specially mentioned, that the conductor is linear. What means linear? It means that Ohm's law is valid with all values of the current. And for surprising, it's surprising that that holds quite well. It's quite linear conductors do exist in our problems. And it is assumed that the conductor is isotropic, which means resistivity is the same in all directions, which does not hold in practice. The body tissues are not isotropic in general. They have very big changes, differences in resistivity uh, in function of orientation. But to, for simplicity, we assume that they are isotropic unless otherwise noted. I introduce to you the bioelectric source. It is the impressed current density, Ji, function of x, y, z, and t. And that's it. That's your friend for the rest of the course. That is a bioelectric source. Does it look quite dull? It is an impressed current density. It is a current source, J, called impressed current den density, current density uh, source uh, with the index I, which represents the transfer of the chemical energy of the cells to electric current. And this current source, impressed current source density, is function of location, x, y, and z, and it is function of time. That is our bioelectric source. It may be a disappointment to you to see that how dull it looks like. It, I think you thought that it should look more interesting. There is a general equation given in the theory at this moment, which is that uh, the total current density J equals to Ji plus sigma E. That, when you look at the papers of Plonsi and Geselovich and perhaps papers of, of, of myself as well, you find this kind of equation. And what does it mean? What, what in the world means that J equals to Ji plus sigma E? It is simple. It's simple if you just think what it means. What is the impressed current density? Where it is? Impressed current density, as I said, it represents the transfer of ionic uh, or chemical energy to 
electric current in the activating, depolarizing or repolarizing cells. So the source Ji, for instance, in the heart, exists only there where is taking place depolarization, activation at this instant of time. It does not exist anywhere else. It exists only on the depolarizing layer. Due to this current source, there exists the return current in the body. The current is flowing like this in the body. And this return current is sigma E. So the total current in any point in the volume conductor is Ji plus sigma E. And now please note that Ji does exist only in the region of electric activity, depolarization or repolarization region only there. But sigma E exists everywhere in the volume conductor, everywhere all the time when there is activation somewhere. Then I tell you about quasi-static conditions. Well, this is just a short story, and after I have told this, you may forget it. I think that if I hadn't uh, discussed this, I think no one had asked me that uh, is the situation quasi-static. No, I don't think anyone had asked it, but I tell it just to be consistent and faithful with the theory. In the volume conductor formed by the human body in the frequency band of bioelectric sources, the capacitive component is negligible in the body. The medium is only resistive, there is no inductance. The currents are conduction currents and the electromagnetic propagation effect may be neglected in these dimensions and in this frequency band. Which means that any instant of time, the field in the body is function of the source, only the source value of that same instant of time. So the current fields behave as if they were stationary. So the phase of time variation can be ignored. So that means quasi-static. Quasi-static means that just like static conditions. Uh, always when I lecture is I mention the Plonzi and Hefner publication and I mention that I should check again from the Plonzi and Hefner publication what kind of error we do when we assume that the body is quasi-stationary system. Uh, I should check it so that I, I could give it the, the number but I forget it again. But I have the feeling that when measuring the ECG from the tip of the toe and the tip of the hand, if we assume that the body really is quasi-stationary, we make an error which is less than 5%, something like that. If the measurements are made closer to heart, it's neg negligible. That's my, my um, uh, understanding, but I should check again from the publication, but this is uh, the basic publication to discuss the quasi-stationary. Now I have told you about quasi-stationary, now you may forget it. And we are one minute before and I think that I would like to... I use the one minute, please remain seated for one minute. I tell this but I may repeat that next time. Since electric field is quasi-static, it is negative gradient of scalar potential phi and we can write the previous equation like this. Since tissue capacitance is negligible, the divergence of J is zero, and this equation 7.1 reduces to Poisson equation given here, nabla dot J i, finally sigma nabla square phi. Is seven, equation 7.3 is a partial differential equation satisfied by phi, in which nabla dot J i is source function, and solution for equation 7.3 for scalar function sigma phi is generally this. I give the reference to Stratton, which is I use, was used in the United States as a basic book of electromagnetism, very old book. You may think take a more new one, but you find the same result. 
where minus nabla.ji is defined as a flow source density, why a flow source, I tell you later on about vortex source, and solution outside the source region is this. That's it. What is this? This is the electric field in infinite homogeneous, homogeneous volume conductor due to the distribution of Ji. This is the bioelectric field due to the bioelectric source. That is the equation. Again, looks quite dull, but that's it. And I repeat, where does it hold? No, it does not hold in the human body, no. It holds in infinite homogeneous volume conductor, which means that if you take the patient to the center of the Atlantic Ocean and they make measurements in, in the sea, which is an infinite homogeneous volume conductor for a great deal, then this equation tells what is the electric field around the body due to the electric activation Ji of the heart. That's it. And now it is now it is 40, exactly 14 to 12. I think it's time to stop. And I, in my understanding, there is no lecture next Tuesday. So there's some, you have some election of some uh, members of the committees and so on. So please have a good election and we meet after two weeks. Thank you very much.